Let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, and we're going to do part two. I'm not going to do a lot of reviewing, but I build on the case of freedom from toxic emotions. Man was created, as we know, in the image of God, and therefore man was created with three, three qualities, spiritual, mental, and physical. Right? No, no. What did I say? Three qualities. That's right. And the emotions all involved with that in mental. We'll see that. So man is spiritual, mental, and physical. And when Jesus said in John 5, 6, Will thou be made whole? Wholeness is spiritual, mental, physical well-being. It's three now. All those things y'all are saying, emotion, is following in those three principles. Mind, the spirit, and body. Now, Jesus had a method of healing. And he is our example of how we go about healing. And we'll find this situation in the book of Matthew. I'd like for you to go there. I believe in Matthew chapter... <coughs> 9, Matthew 9. A man is made up again, three qualities. What are those three qualities again? Mental, spiritual, and physical. Even, well, people keep saying emotional. We're going to find out that falls under those three aspects. Man is only three, physical, mental, and spiritual. It's going to cover all of that. You got to keep this in mind. Physical, mental, spiritual. 3 John 2 tells us that. We find in Thessalonians tell us about wholeness, body, mind, soul, spirit. When we go back to Genesis, God created man from the dust of the ground. Then he breathed into him the breath of life. Then man became a living soul. Dust, physical. We find breath of life, that's the spiritual. Man became a living soul, that's a physical. In Deuteronomy 6, 5, it said, Love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy might, with all thy soul. Three parts. All right, in Matthew, you there with me? Chapter 9, all right? You put your eyes here, I'm going to read here, beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, are you with me there? He entered a ship and passed where? Over and came to his own city. In verse 2, what verse 2 says? Sick of the palsy. Man, this man was having paralysis problem. Now, they brought him to Jesus, and this is what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? Verse 2. Son, what? All right, stop right there. He said, son, be of good cheer. That is addressing the mental aspect. Another word for good cheer means be of courage. So this man had a sickness, and the first thing Jesus said, son, be of good cheer. That's mental. What is it, what's the next thing he said? That is spiritual. That's spiritual. Go to verse 8. Somebody read verse 8, what it says. Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> Keep reading. And then you read on down, to, read on down to verse thirteen. Mm -hmm. And then you read verse twelve. But when Jesus, yeah, Matthew nine, no, Matthew you. I'm in Matthew 9 now. Are y'all still with me? Yes. Um, let me read for the case. Matthew, 12, Matthew 9, 12. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they are sick. And so when we read on down in Matthew uh, chapter 9, we find that Christ then told the man, Pick up that bed and walk eventually. So Christ always started with the mental disposition 
of the sick person. Because when we find ourselves in depression or despondent, it is impossible for us, our body, to respond. I read where nine-tenths of all sickness is of a spiritual nature, of a mental state. That means, case in point, when you are encumbered with stress, now let me say this before I lose your own stress. Now, stress is not a problem. Stress is not a problem. Hmm? Hmm? Well, in fact, I'm, I just want to emphasize this because people said, I got to get from under this stress. If I can get rid of stress out of my life, I would be all right. Have anybody ever said that? I know we said that. Even though I said, I got to get rid of the stress, et cetera. Now, I want you to follow me, then we're going to go quickly. Now, here is a definition. Stress is valuable to human growth. It is essential for growth. Without it, can be no growth. Case in point, if I'm going to build muscles, I'm going to put stress, tension on those muscles. Hmm? If I'm going to build a strong mind, I'm going to tax my mind, stress. Therefore, if I'm going to build virtue, spiritual virtues, I'm going to have trials and tests. Hmm? So stress only becomes destructive. Listen to this. Stress becomes destructive when its intensity and duration exceeds my capacity to respond constructively. I'm going to repeat that again. You, I mentioned two words, intensity and duration. What does that word intensity mean? Intensity. It's the strength. It's the strength. All right? What about duration? It's the length. It's the long. So strength and the length. Stress becomes destructive when the strength and the length exceeds your capacity, my capacity to respond constructively. You get that? So the problem is not the stress. It's how you respond to it. Okay, it's important. Say, well, you know, these people here are really stressing me out. All right? Well, we said that, you know, stressing me out. So, therefore, I can get rid of the people. Say so you get rid of the people that are stressing you out. Get rid of them. No, 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 don't say no. Just follow me now because you're not getting this. That's what we be thinking. Get rid of the people because they're the one that causing my stress. Right? Court, right? Now, you, now, I know she's shaking her head, but you got to get this. <laughs> stress is not your enemy. Right. All right? Student, I know you're right. Just, just follow me for a moment. So if you get rid of the people who's causing your stress, then you're going to be happy, Right? Well, what do you mean get rid of? Okay, hold on. I'm, I'm, I want to come up. She's going to teach this class. <laughs> She's going to teach this class. You ready? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Man, you show. Sure you ain't told me nothing yet. You make me look too tall. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you can sit back down. Go ahead. I'm just closer to the ground you, no, I know, because by you standing next to me, I, I, I feel like I'm 20 feet tall. <laughs> All right. You raise a question. Now, uh, let, hold your question. Don't sure. lose it. Sure. I'm bringing out a point. Let me just bring it this way, okay? I do also lifestyle coaching. Family calls me. So, Dr. Jackson, I have an adolescent daughter about 11 years of age, and she is a problem. She is a problem. I'm listening to both parents. She's a problem. They're they very emotional, very problem. So I'm listening to them. They explain the young lady behavior, et cetera. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details. This is what I said to him. I said, now, your daughter is not your problem. She has a problem. Does anybody understand what I'm saying with that? Your daughter is not your problem. The people that stressing you out is not your stress. They have a problem. All right? Now, listen. Okay. Listen. And you have a problem. I'm glad Teddy heard that. I'm going to say it again. The daughter is not their problem. She has a problem. And I told them, you have a problem. I'm being very deliberate. So when you said, 
These folks are my problem. They might have a problem, but you have a problem also. Now, what am I saying? It's how you responding to them. You ain't get what I'm saying. All right. So now, two problems cannot solve a problem. You got to put it in perspective. That means that the people, because human relationship is valuable, that means that if you are being so called stressed out, being toxic because of these relationships that, is, that they are not redempted, then you're going to transfer your own perspective, your own internal struggle to the other person. And you're going to see that person through your own eyes of your problems, which you fail to recognize you have a problem. Now, how do I know that? That means if a, pro- if a person is creating such agitation and frustration in your life, you're going to react to it. You're not going to respond to it. You're going to react to it because your first reaction is that you've got to protect your boundaries, your turf. Anybody understand what I'm saying? You've got to protect yourself. Huh? Whether, whether you recognize it or that. Now, here's the key. God has given each individual three God-given inner needs. Three inner needs. Three inner needs. The first one, love. The second one, significance. The third one is acceptance. Now, if you don't, can't remember that, you can always I can email this information. Now, what's the three inner needs? Love. All right. Now, I put them in three A's, three A's, love, adoration, significant affirmation, acceptance, I mean, security, acceptance, adoration, affirmation, and acceptance. All right. Now, okay. I was talking to Teddy him and his wife, been married for 60 years or so, a long time. My wife and I just celebrated our 50th anniversary in June. Now. Thank you. Just keep praying for us. Right there? Right. See, see that? <laughs> you think her well. What? <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Jack? I trained you well. <laughs> uh, I know that's not true. God trained me well. That's why we're still married. <laughs> no. No, that's, the, that's why we're still married, because God took this old wretched heart of mine, and gave me a heart like his heart. And so, those, now what's those three God giving me the needs? Love. That's right. Those three needs are the basis for all of our behavior. They are the foundation for all of our behavior. We're looking for love. We're looking for significance. We're looking for uh, security. We get married. We get married for the wrong reasons. I know I did early because we don't know the purpose of marriage. We get married because we want love. We get married for security. huh? We get married to be happy. Now, remember? I said, stress. If you are dependent on an individual for your happiness, your love, and etc., Something happened to that person. There goes your love, acceptance, and your significance. Anybody listen to what I'm saying? Oh, somebody said no over here. I'm going to say it again. If I'm seeking for happiness, then I'm looking for a woman that's going to make me happy. I'm looking for the woman that's going to make me happy. I'm going to say it again. I'm looking for the woman that's going to make me happy. Well, so what is happiness? Well, no, 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 y'all, because I'm trying to w- get y'all thinking. So therefore, my <laughs> happiness is dependent upon the woman. Mm-hmm. All right? Mm-hmm. On the woman. Now, when that woman don't make me happy, what happens? <laughs> to me. It's going to affect me emotionally. Yeah. Right? It's going to do something in my emotions that's not going to be healthy. Mm-hmm. Then I'm going to project that unhappiness that you the cause of me not being happy. And to keep going that way, then I'm going to exchange her for another person, another unhappy person that I'm expecting to make me happy. 
Does anyone understand what I'm trying to say? All right. Let me bring it back. Let me bring it back. Let's go back to Eden. God did not create two human beings at one time. He created one person, Adam. And you read that in the book of Genesis. All right? Now, when he created Adam, he created Adam in his image, in his likeness. That means Adam was created with the capacity to love like God. Adam knew his purpose his identity. Adam knew his life had value and meaning. Adam was happy. Someone quickly go to Psalms 144 and read verse 15. Let my, my, let my little student do this. Hey, my dear. Psalms what? 144, 15. Find out where happiness comes from. Then we're going to finish. I want you to go. I want you to listen because this toxic emotion definitely comes as a result of our environment, especially with human relationships. Now, what does Psalms 144.15 say? Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. So who is the source of that people? God. God. And you can run more scripture. Keep this in mind. Now, I'm not knocking out the importance of human relationship. But if your human relationship, your joy, your peace, your happiness is wrapped up in a human being, you setting yourself up for a miserable life. You might not see that. Like I said, you've been six years, 50 years in marriage when I first started. My, I don't know how you started, but I know I didn't start all right. I'm walking down the high school hallway, you know, basketball player. You know, my mother has a saying. Now, maybe you don't understand this saying. But, you know, when you all puffed up yourself, you know, you think you're great and stuff like that. My mother said, boy, do you smell yourself? Anybody heard that expression? Boy, do you smell yourself? Anybody tell some of these folks what, what you think that means? Do you smell yourself? Huh? You're full of it. You're full of it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> stop right there. <laughs> stop, right, stop right there. <laughs> that means, you know, all proud and puffed up. And so when I'm walking down the hallway and there's a young lady sitting down. I did not see her standing up. I just saw her face. And I had another young lady on my side walking down the hallway who liked me. And I asked the young lady on my side, who was this young lady in that classroom? Uh, That's how I met my wife. Huh? So anyway, seven years later, we get married. Yeah, seven years later. But we still weren't ready to get married. Because those first few years was hell on earth. Not because of her. Not until God came into my life. I had to understand what it looks like to be a biblical husband. What it looked like to be a biblical father. Because I grew up without that image. You know what I'm saying? And so, therefore, you're looking for someone to fulfill your needs. Now, someone go to Psalm 62, verse 5. Since you're all up front, why don't you read, one of y'all read Psalm 62, verse 5 for me. Then we'll move on. And what's those three needs now? Anybody remember three needs? Love. Love. Significant. Significant. And security. Or acceptance. You have Psalm 62.5? You want to read it? One of you? Yeah, read it. What does it say? Okay, you. Yes, somebody use read slow. Uh, it said, my soul wait only on the Lord, for my expectation is only of him. What does the word expectation mean? Expectation. Do we not? I'm quite sure 60 years of your marriage, 50 years of my marriage, marriage, we have expectation. Do we not? Right? From one another. We have expectation from church folks. Expectation. What is meant by expectation? Requirements of a person to fulfill a role. To fulfill some desire. Right. If they do not feel that desire, that does impact us. We get disappointed. Do we not? Now, the Bible says, my expectation is of the Lord. Now, that scripture definitely is written for those who know God. Because I can have expectation for my wife, and she does not fulfill those expectations. That has a negative impact on me. Either she don't love me, don't care, etc. And I began to develop some attitude in regards to that. That began to stress me out. So, therefore, if two people get married, 
I'll go back to Adam, do not have a connection with God. They're going to have un really realistic expectation. Now, God created Adam, all right? Now, he then created Eve. What was the process of creating Eve? What did God do to create Eve? Now, first of all, he put him into a deep sleep. He put him in a deep sleep. All right. That's a doctor speaking. That's right. Now, what did he take from Adam to make Eve? A rib. Keep that in mind. So, now, since God is the creator, did God have to put Adam to sleep to make Eve? Did he have to do it? No, he could have spoke Eve into existence while Adam was still awake. But since he didn't have to do it, but then there's a reason why he did that. Now, remember when he created Adam, he downloaded to Adam love, purpose, identity, security, self-worth, and happiness. Adam had all of that before Eve was created, all right? Now, let's do this. What is the difference between alone and lonely? What's the definition of the word alone? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Hey, we got a crowd of people in here. Everybody leave out. I'm here alone. That's a physical state. Alone is a physical state. What about lonely? Here we are here. We listen. But still in all, there's something missing. Empty. A feeling of empty. So lonely is an emotional state. Lonely is an emotional state. Did you hear that? Alone is a physical state. Lonely is an emotional state. Now, the Bible says not good, Teddy, for God, for man to be lonely. Why? Because it's written in the word of God. It did not say it's not good for man to be lonely because Adam was not lonely. I'm, I'm emphasizing this because I know you say, okay, but you got you to get rid of me. He was not lonely. He was not emotionally unstable. He was secure in who he is. All right? Now, so he put Adam to sleep to make Eve. What's the purpose? Here's the purpose, ladies. <laughs> no, let's not go there. Give me, give me 10 seconds. Let me explain this. He put Adam into a deep sleep so he can spend personal time with Eve. And what he did with Eve, he did the same thing he did with Adam. He imparted to Eve love. Purpose, identity, security, self-worth. God personally gave to that woman the same thing he gave to Adam. You got to get this. The difference between man and woman is that one of biological, hormonal. Women are created biologically different from men because that was part of the creator's plan to procreate. Are you understand? Yes. Even if you think about that, you got to think about same-sex marriage. That's not in God's plan. No. Come on. All right. Okay. I don't want to open no cans of worms. All right. Therefore, now, Eve was equal to Adam. So we don't need no women's lib. Or women pastors. All right. Keep that in mind now. Adam and Eve had received the same quality. They was equal in that respect. There was no inferiority there. Are you listening to me? They both had unique, distinct role, complementary to fulfill, fulfill God's purpose. I'm going to go backwards, then I'm going to come forward. Now, God said, I'm going to make your help meet. Help meet. What is meant by that? Hmm? Help meet. Hmm? Meet, M-E-E-T, meet. A partner. A partner. For what purpose? To help to support her husband. Help to support her husband, huh? Daily basis. On a daily basis, huh? Okay, now. God created Adam in his image, in his likeness, and placed Adam on this earth to meet God's responsibility. Adam was to glorify God. Eve brought qualities to this mix to help Adam to meet God's expectation. Not man's expectation. God's expectation. 
In Philippians chapter 3, 14, he said, I press towards the mark, the high calling of God in Christ. The high calling of God in Christ is godliness, God-likeness. He was created with such capacity to be complementary to him to help this man to reach the pinnacle of God-likeness. Men folk, you get that? Women folk, you were not the man's suitcase carrier, etc. You were there to bring what God had given you to complement man in fulfilling God's purpose on this earth. Let's go back to the rib. This is the purpose of marriage. This is one because toxic emotions in marriage and everything. What is the anatomical purpose, physiological purpose of the rib? Huh? To what? No, no, not the rib. I'm sorry. How are you going to procreate? What, what planet are you from? Procreate. No, not, not the rib. But she said something. No, 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 no. no. What would you say? To protect the vital, especially the heart. It protects the heart. All right. Now, what they got to do with marriage? You're fine and tight. Excuse me, brother. In the book of Jeremiah 6, 2, a woman is a type of the church. Bible students. In 1 Corinthians 15, Adam is a, Christ, is a type of Christ. So marriage was designed to protect the heart of God. Marriage was designed to protect the heart. Of God. Let me give you an example. That I'm married, so the way I treat my wife, I'm treating God. The way I speak to my wife, I'm speaking to God. If I speak ugly words to my wife, I'm not hurt, I'm hurting God. I got to be intentional with that. That how I represent myself as a husband is because God put two people together to reveal the heart of God. To a loveless world. Mm. Mm? Now, I'm going to say something, then I'm going to move forward because I'm not going to tear it there because it's going to open up cans and work. Marriage was never designed to make you happy. You clear? Your, you all right? Yes. Okay. People go buy a new car to make them happy, but you know, that's temporary. Mm hmm. But then you get married. Then you get married. Are you married? 28 years. Then you marry that woman so you can be happy. Oh, oh man, don't be hesitant. You know no, you do. No, no, no. I'm thinking back. I was, I was <laughs> no, wait. Here. Hey. Oh, <laughs> I'll stand up here next to you. I'm just as tall as you are. No, you, so, you're a big man. <laughs> no, I, I, when I got married, I got married when I was 29 years old. And I felt a lot of um, uh, anxiety. Mm. Was I ever going to find the right person? And so when I found uh, my wife here, I knew I had found the right person because I had found my best friend. And so if I, there were some other things in my life that I put was putting before this relationship, mm -hmm. but then I decided what was really important you, was this. You found your wife. We found each other. Y'all were lost, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody in the 20s? <laughs> that's how, that's in you. A lot of people, you know. I was out having a good time. But, see, but you started off. In a different way, but now you see a little more light about your marriage. Well, I'm older and wiser now. Mm. I don't know. I don't know what. I neither do I. I. But but I'm older and wiser now. But you My know, priorities are different. Amen. So therefore, now she's a joy of your life. She makes you happy. Most of the time. Oh. So. <laughs> now you better sit down for asking me a question. A okay, man. Harold, I don't got about ten minutes. Yeah, no, no, you. Yeah. I got you. I got you. Look at look at him. He's looking at. I got you, I got you. Which, what do you mean I, you got me? I, I'm trying to help you, man, because you can. I'm, I'm going to take you down some deep waters you won't be able to well, get out. Well, come on, take me down. He's a t 28 years, huh? 28 years, that's right. <laughs> I, I don't look, I get, I, I'm not looking I got you. for her to make you happy like that. You, you have, if you're not happy with your relationship with the Lord and yourself and other things, there's no way that she, I don't look for that. Okay, that's important, that's important. That is very important. That's, that's but how many of us come to that place in the initial run that we're looking for something from that relationship that's going to fulfill our human needs? All the first 90 days is they can do no wrong. Okay, well, like I said, you know, at, after the honeymoon, the suitcase opened. <laughs> right. I didn't know you snore like that. I didn't know you can't cook. I didn't know you was fussy like that. It comes, but the point is, you, 
when God brought Adam and Eve together, he did not bring, when people come and see me, they say, man, where's your better half? People say that. What? And I look at myself, I'm already a thin guy. I'd be looking at myself, my other half. What more can be had than me? God created a whole person. All right? The woman was created with the same qualities that Adam had. And they both were complementary. They both got those from God, not from one another. Eve did not come to Adam looking for her purpose or her identity or her security or her happiness. She was already secure in a relationship with God because the prerequisite for marriage is conversion. A person needs to know who they are before they take another human being into their lives. If you don't know who you are and your purpose, especially the man, if a man don't know his purpose, his identity, his calling, how are you going to take a woman into your life and help her to find her sense of direction? You can't do it. It's going to be a struggle. Now, marriage is not domestic. It's toxic emotion. I'm just saying those emotions rise up when two people in a relationship, they're not on the same spiritual page. And they hold one another responsible for their miseries. That's why divorce is paramount in the church, more so in the world, in the church. And therefore, we find God's permissive will for divorce when he said, what well, God has joined together, let no man tear asunder. He said, I hate divorce. That's what he said. I hate divorce. But because of the hardness of your heart, I give you permission to get divorced based on adultery. That's God's permissive will, not his perfect will. I remember a close friend of mine many, many years ago, married. He was having his wife went out, committed adultery. He found out about it. He forgave her. Forgave her. Heart of God. She went out and committed adultery a second time. This time, she had a baby. That was a double whammy. So what do you think this guy did this time? Forgave her. He forgave her. Brought her home and the baby. And they live in hell, happy ever after. Now, I know you say, uh, forgiveness, follow me, forgiveness is the epitome of God. Amen. Now follow me. You say, uh, this way. Now, when someone hurts you, it builds up a wall. Now listen to me. And every time you think of that person who hurt you, toxic emotion, that person who hurt you is living rent-free in your head. Mm -hmm. Did anybody understand what I just said? The person that hurt you, every time you think about it, it brings bad feelings. Are you with me? They live in rent-free in your head. You must give them eviction notice. Now, follow me. Now, I don't know about your eviction notice. I'm going to tell you what God's eviction notice is. <laughs> you got to give them eviction notice. You go to the person. Hmm? You say, I forgive you. And it's not a mechanical. God said, forgive them as I forgave you. Love them as I love you. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean what they did to you is all right. Amen. <laughs> you knew you was going to get that. I know that. Is that where I, my question, or my, I'm sorry, my original question was about getting rid of somebody? Mm -hmm. okay. Come on now. Yeah, you're right. That's right. I knew you. I got you. Now, forgiveness, it takes one person to forgive. Two person, you mentioned the word reconciliation. We don't forgive because we're saying that person's not going to respond. That's not your business. Your business is to forgive. And that forgiveness is not mechanical forgiveness. It's got to, God got to be in your life. God will bring about the reconciliation because it takes two. The other person got to be willing to come. I go back, share these as a testimony. A father grew up 30 years of my life, and there's no father. Abandoned, Okay. I didn't begin to realize the impact it had me on emotions. So I went to college playing sports. And then when they had parents come to college, everybody had a father up there, and I didn't have no daddy. My mother, my sisters, and, and my 
Brad to be was there. And I thought about this. I thought about I'm the eighth child of eight children, the youngest and the baby. Only two of us left today. My older sister, which now is with us, she's a 100 years of age. 100. She was a diabetic, high blood pressure, no diabetes, no high blood pressure. She, she's been living with us. She's 100 years of age, made it this year. I'm 75. She helped raise me. Now I have the privilege to return the joy to my sister. Are you with me? And so therefore, this man was living rent-free in my head because I had bitterness, anger, and resentment. And before I encountered Jesus, I said, if I ever found this man, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. Anybody ever said you're going to give people a piece of your mind? You ever said that expression? If you did, that's why you walk around here crazy now. Because uh -huh. you gave everybody a piece of your mind. <laughs> that messed you up. Yeah, well, anyway. And so, make a long story short on this, then we get back. I'm into the work now, and I was born in Alabama, raised in Chicago. I was doing some meetings in Alabama, a little city close to where I was born. We was driving back. I told the brother, I said, look, I was born in this town. My father's in this town. I have never met the man in my life. Just had anger, bitterness. But God had done a number on my heart. So what I did, located him, we met in his front yard. And I looked at him down first time, and I spoke about his mother, et cetera. So we, we're the right people. That's my dad, I'm his son. So I reached out and shook, took his hand. I said, you know, I'm your son. I looked in his eyes. I said, I'm here for two reasons, two reasons. I let him know I'm not here for no money. I'm telling him how I'm doing, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I looked at him. I said, and then I, said I forgive you. Mm. I did not go through any explanation. And then I said, I need something from you. And I, when I held him, I said, I said, I need something from you. Will you forgive me for hating you and resenting you? Just like that. When I said that, it seemed like a weight came off my shoulders. I gave an eviction notice. Then I left my information because I know he was already married. So again, because I didn't want to disrupt his family. But he died a year later. 30 years living rent-free in my head. Anger. I had to evict him. That's not a negative thing. That's freedom. Living with toxic emotions for 30 years. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We've, we've been blessed and privileged to hear this lesson from you. How do we help someone that we know I just told you how. I just told you. If you look, you only can, a parachute only work when it's open. You cannot force it on it. You have to be prayed up. Like every morning when I get up and say, Lord, you bring me in contact with the person you want me to connect with you. Even though you cannot make contact with that person, but you know what you do? You stay on your knees. That, that's fine then. But you're not at peace with that, are you? I am. They're not. No, no, no. no. They don't the want to need help, right? Right? They don't the want to need help. And you can't make contact. But you can contact the person who created him. You get what I'm saying? You've got to understand the power of prayer. You find J Joe prayed for his children. Joe, he prayed. You pray for that friend. If you can't make a contact, most definitely. I can say to tell you more so, even with children, when children, you know, go astray. In the book of Joel, when it says that the canker worms, the caterpillars, and the locusts will, will just spoil them, he said, I will restore. And when you line yourself up with God, when you line yourself, you, now remember this, the branch and the vine, the vine, Jesus, the branch is you and I, John 15, 5. Now, the purpose of the branch is to bear fruit. It does not produce fruit. Did you get that? The vine produced the fruit. <coughs> and you bear the fruit. Now, what's the fruit for? What's the purpose of the fruit? Huh? All right, it's glorified God. What else? It feeds somebody. You never seen an apple tree eat its own apples? 
Hello? The fruit is for other people. We are told that the Christian life, the object of the Christian life is fruit bearing. And that the reproduction of Christ's character in your life will be reproduced in the lives of other people. Amen. You didn't get what I, somebody heard of that. Amen. So the fruit that comes from me that's produced by Jesus is for my children who might not be in or my fellow worker. You get what I'm saying? I don't have to go around trying to correct folk. I can encourage them in the Lord, but they got to see, number one, some genuineness in your life. You pray for that soul. Therefore, the toxic emotion comes as a result. We have not found out our purpose and identity. We're looking for love. We're looking for security. We're looking for significant all in the wrong place. Hmm? In the wrong place. Instead of us finding who we are in Christ, then we are fortified, you know, to love somebody. You know, love is risky business. Outside of one person. Is love risky? Loving somebody. Amen. All right, let, let, let's deal with uh, Eros love, human love. Gopi love is risky too. <coughs> one day my wife was going, through, going to church. She was going through the back roads. <clears throat> and there was a turtle in the middle of the road. Stop. And usually you go around and over. Some told me to stop. Get out. Never done this before. I got out, looked at the turtle. I got a stick. I got behind him. I was going to try to scoot him across the street. But he wouldn't move. <laughs> no, he had no broken leg. <laughs> so I got back in the car. I said, honey, why this turtle is not moving? She said, fear, fear. All right? He felt dangerous. He tuck his neck in. You know, when they're scared, they tuck his neck in. Because he cannot go anywhere unless the neck is stuck out. I want you to listen to me now. Now, the fear is he felt danger. That's why he tuck his neck in. And when we think of this concept, the great guff fix. Guff fix. Sin that created a guff between heaven and earth. And Christ crossed the great gulf fix that he might rescue me from sin. Why? Wow, he liked it. He stuck his neck out. He stuck his neck out because loving way God loved is risky business. It can cause you to get your neck chopped off. We are afraid to let God love somebody through us because we still got our neck tucked in. We still self-focused. We still insecure. We still not experiencing love. Not until we come free. We always going to experience toxic emotions because we can't be free to love like God loves. Because people are going to take advantage of that. They will do that. They did it to Jesus. They took advantage of him and nailed him to the cross. In his dying words, the Lord, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He loved them. And this is the type of people that God is coming for. A type of people who will allow the love of God to flow through them to the unlovable in a redemptive way and not punitive. That's the type of people. And that is impossible for you and I. John 15, 5 said, without Christ you cannot do that, but with Christ you can. Now, I'm going to fast on because I tired moving. I want to give you a closing statement, but I want a few things here before we close in these short minutes. Now, how many have been following me so far what I've been saying? Those three God-given inner needs, love, significance, and security, is the foundation for all of our behavior. Mm -hmm. And what's so good about that? See, if one person could fulfill all of our needs, we would not need God. Oh, but let me pause for a moment. However, sometimes 
God used other people as an extension of his compassion and his love. Did you get that? Case in point. Father that I knew for 30 years out of my life, then he brought, another, he brought a man into my life. That's why I'm an Adventist Christian today. 45 years ago, God brought a man to my house, wanted to buy my house. I didn't know who he was, but the story goes on, and here I stand today. He became like a spiritual father to me. He became an extension of God. And that's the way God would use all of us to be extension to someone. And so we find those three needs are very important. And we find that all of our feelings, words, action begin with our thoughts. We must carefully evaluate everything that enters our mind. Proverbs 4.23. For out of the heart come the issues of life. Huh? So we find here said thoughts drive your emotions. What you think you become. When your thoughts appear to be the product of your overwhelming sadness, grief, and know that it is your thoughts that are feeling the sadness rather than your other way around. Your thoughts generate a feeling when you then act upon it. So your feelings flows from your thoughts. <coughs> Negative attitudes and feeling of helplessness, hopelessness can create chronic stress which upsets the body hormone balance depletes the brain chemicals required for happiness and damage the immune system. Chronic stress can actually decrease our lifespan. Starting right here. Hmm? The mind and especially the emotions are among the most powerful influence which affects the body. The mind and our emotion affects our body. What was once speculation has now been firmly established as fact, according to secular right. A healthy body cannot be divorced from a healthy mind or a healthy spirit. Emotional health, it can be said with certainty, is an integral part of our overall wellness. Yet many people continue to neglect their emotional health and damage their physical health in the process. Stress. That is a stress. Well, let's go back. Stress caused by unresolved Emotional issues, for example, remains one of the leading contributors of illness. Unresolved. People living rent-free in your head. You've got to resolve that. Here, it says certain emotion pours in the body, according to Dr. Cannon of Harvard University, has shown that hate, envy, scorn, jealousy, and fear actually create poisons. Not psychological poison but powerful toxic substance which poison the life strain, the blood. And under the influence, the body weakens. Poison, toxic poison. All the life processes are disturbed. A person who lives under fear or under the shadow of any depressing emotion seems to shrivel up. He grows old prematurely. Worry kills a hundred people where work only kills one. Hmm? Toxic emotion. Repressed, suppressed, and unexpressed emotion affects our physical and spiritual well-being. These emotions are a source of everything from irritability, road rage, to despondency, and chronic depression. They add fuel to the fire. When we feel an emotion that causes us to react rather than respond to a situation in a constructive way. Effects. Dr. Northrop writes, a thought, a thought held long enough and repeated often enough becomes a belief. That belief, amen, that belief then becomes a biology in which emotional stress causes our adrenal glands. Now, that's how our adrenal glands that sit on the back of your kidneys, it produces corticosteroids or adrenaline and where that suppresses our immune system. Even that will produce the inhibition of insulin being production. Just that stress that will predispose a person being a diabetic. That's how the mind works. As soon, now listen to this. You are think you are a thinking being. Are we not? Even as you listen to me, you're thinking. It says, as long as soon as you wake up in the morning, you think. Hmm? All day long, you are thinking and processing information. The last thing you do at night is think. Even in your sleep, 
your brain is sorting out your thinking. Hello? Between the hours of 9 and 12, there's a process called glenfatic process. The brain detoxifies between the hours of 9 and 12 o'clock. About 38 years of this ministry, I will go to bed, still go to bed, when I'm not in meetings at 9 p.m. sharp. But for 38, why? I, 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 I was programmed by that. But listen to what I'm saying. I go to, how? How do I go to bed at 9 p.m.? She said, how? How are you doing that? Well, just listen to my story, and then I'll tell you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you. I go to bed for 30, first 30 years, 9 p.m., but I will not go to sleep to 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. in the morning. Now, why? Why? There's a word. I'm ruminating. What ruminating? I'm regurgitating what took place today, then I got a plan for tomorrow. Anybody listen to me? That stuff that I did today is I'm going over and over. Now I got to have all of my T's crossed, my commas and my periods. You get what I'm saying? Now in the ministry, we got 20-some folks on staff, a whole lot of dynamics there. For 38 years, I'm in bed at 9 p.m. And you're saying that's the healthy way. I didn't say that. God said that. Okay. I'm just obeying God. <laughs> okay. But let me get, but I wouldn't go to bed. To 2 a.m., 3 a.m., that's not healthy. Anybody listen to me? Now, people say, when I go to bed, go to sleep. Now, that's different. You can go to sleep when you go to bed. You can have what you call fatigue sleep. You're tired. That's not rejuvenating. When you're tired, you, yeah, you're going <clears> to <throat> knock out. But truly, to go to bed and lay down at 9 o'clock and no thoughts about tomorrow or today is rejuvenating sleep. 38 years. That's what I did. Didn't go to sleep till 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm, a think, I'm thinking. I'm planning. I'm processing. Still working. Huh? It goes on and says here, even in your sleep, your brain is sorting out your thinking. Because we think so much, it can be tempting to believe that our thoughts are not very important. Certainly not powerful enough to change the course of our lives or alter the physical state of our body. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Thoughts are important. It's how they are handled. It says here, biochemistry or toxic emotion. When we are under these e e stressful situations, the body releases a response. A stress response starts in the brain. The brain will turbocharge hormones through your blood system, down to the adrenal gland. It circulates through the whole body, impacting every organ in your body. And the body unleashes a flood of hormones that can cause significant damage. This is when you are faced with all these situations. Brain function. Listen to this. Diasia. Satan's craft is more successful against those who are depressed by difficulties. Hmm? Depressed by difficulties. You don't have financial challenges, staff challenges, family challenges, children challenges. You know what I'm saying? Difficulties. Suppressed by difficulties. He knows he can control us. And we'll, we'll see a solution to this as we get close to the end here. I'm sorry about that. Let's go back. It says here, Though, Therefore he, Jesus, pointed them away from the things which are seen to the things which are not seen. From earthly exile, he turned their thoughts to the heavenly home. Emotional stress that can cause practically any disease, including arthritis, ulcers, cancer, high blood pressure, you name it, any disease. You can have the best vegan plant-based diet. And if you are filled with toxic emotion, it will just counteract all of that. Huh? Here from Dr. Christian Northrop, she says, suppress anger is probably the most toxic emotion of all. Anger. Su suppress anger. Listen to what it says. The physiology of suppressed anger leads to poor behavior choices and poor health. We need both mental and physical action to remedy the physiology of toxic endogenous neurochemicals that build up in the brain when anger is suppressed. You don't sweep that stuff under the rug. When you sweep it under the rug, it gets lumpy. You got to get rid of it. But you got to have a way. Listen to what it says here. Anger is our emotional security system. 
When someone or something invades our emotional or physical or spiritual boundaries, we become angry. Hmm? But few people know how to deal with their anger in a healthy way. Angry behaviors do little to address the root causes of this primary emotion and may, in fact, perpetuate it. Anger. Anger. Anger opens the heart to Satan. Anger is a demon. It opens the heart to Satan. He comes in. Those who at any supposed provocation feel that liberty to indulge angry, anger or resentment as I had towards my father. I'll open the heart to Satan. Yeah, God said, do not let the sun go down on your realm. That's not where we're getting anger from, but if you are an angry person, you know, my dear, not to rehearse this, but when I had this deaf experience seven years ago, as I told the folks, and then when God eventually woke me up, I asked my wife, I said, how was it between you and I for this experience happened? It would have been too late. If we had been angry at one another, and when I was there in England, didn't wake up that Saturday morning, it had been too late. Hmm? You cannot afford for one moment to go to bed with resentment in your heart. Now, I didn't have no sickness. Uh, I was doing well. I didn't wake up at that time. That's what it means. So not, let not the sun go down on your wrath. If there's every night when you before you pray, you need to pray, Lord, search your heart. Whatever I have done, have I dishonored you today? You need to have it right before you go to sleep. I'm telling you, folks, I'm awake because of God's just miracle, because I know what it means. That's the first thing I asked my wife. Did I say anything to you? Was it all right with us? If it wasn't, it'd been too late. You get what I'm saying? That's what that means. Let not the sun go down on your rev. One minute of anger suppresses your immune system for six hours. <laughs> Coupled with that with poor eating. <laughs> Lifestyle. Six hours. Huh? We sit around here looking all pretty nice for one minute of anger. But on the flip side, on the best side of that, we find one minute of one minute of laughter. That's healthy, redemptive laughter improves your immune system for 24 hours. You know, it takes more energy to have frowns on your face. I tell my wife, put a, you know, you don't want to put no phony smile. You got to have the spirit of God flowing through you. Amen. It needs to radiate, suppress anger. Merry heart. God has not given us a heart of fear, but a sound mind. Hmm? Sound mind. The creative energy, energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise. Accepted by the will. Received into the soul. It brings with it life of the infinite God. When we open up our hearts to God's word, it brings life. You see, this right here, this Bible... This is the very mind of God. Do you know this? Amen. It's not something you throw down, put something on top of. These pages here contain the very mind of God. When we come in contact with the word, we come in contact with the infinite mind. When these words are received in the heart, it comes, it comes with it, the infinite God that will live out his life through you and I. Amen. It will live it out. It goes on and says here, it transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. The life thus imparted is in like manner sustained. By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, man should live by it. Amen. Conclusion. Beliefs originate from the information we are repeatedly allowed to enter our minds through our five senses. If we repeat information that comes to over and over again, it's not in harmony with God, it's going to create a belief, it's going to create a, per a perception how you view other people through your own belief. Do you know that? You see people through your own eyes and not through the eyes of God. It goes on to say, the way that we respond to situation in life comes from our beliefs, habits of thinking and feeling. 
by God's enabling grace, we overcome health de damaging habits of response as follows. Number one, we have to make a decision to keep as many, I would say all negative things as possible from coming into our mind. How do you do that? Number one, you'll find, basically, two thoughts cannot occupy the same space in your mind. Do you understand that? There's no way you can be thinking your thoughts and God's thoughts at the same time. They cannot occupy. If you've gone down in the countryside and you've seen cows going into the pasture, they got a little trail. You ever seen a trail? I mean, it's a path. It's a groove. It's a groove. They come back and forth, back and forth. So we have grooves in our brain. And every time we receive a thought and rehearse, it creates a groove in our brain. Did you know that? It gets situated. Now, you can't get rid of the groove. You've got to override the groove with God's word. The more you come in contact with this right here, not just reading, but you've got to spend time in this word. It will override the grooves. It will put in your mind thoughts of God. And the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, when the enemy comes in and says to you, you see that person, how they mistreated you, you need to get back with them. Get at, get at them. That's the enemy speaking. But if you have filled your mind with his word and his promise, and God will raise up a standard against that enemy. Did anybody understand what I'm saying? Here, but you've got to put it in the mind Amen. if you're going to overcome toxic behavior. That's what it means. Psalm 101, verse 3. Then it says, be willing to reexamine and challenge with authoritative standard of God's word. The knowledge we may hold in our hearts that leads to any unhealthy beliefs. If I'm going down the wrong road with unhealthy belief, I have to examine it. Is this belief, can it be supported? I'm just bringing it back to the word. Can it be supported by God's word? Even if you're sitting here thinking, even thoughts about somebody, are these thoughts of God or are they my thoughts that have been shaped by my failures and my experience? You've got to challenge that. And it goes on here. Replace any false knowledge with truth, health-promoting knowledge. Then bring our words, attitudes, and action into harmony with the new healing thoughts. Even we face many trials in the process of changing our ways. That simply means as we truly avail ourselves to God's word, that does not mean you're going to be exempt from trials. You're not going to be uh, prevented from trials. You're going to have trials. Please get this in your mind. Jesus did not get out of this world without trials. Trials, listen, yeah. trials are necessary. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you believe that? I'm knowing it. Okay. Well, She's feeling it. Yeah, but, but I, I want to I be very sober about this. <coughs> trials are part of the Christian process. Mm. Circumstances that God allows if we have the right perspective from God's word, become, circumstance, becomes our helper. <laughs> you know, it's hard to see that, huh? I know it. It's right. Because I didn't know that until I realized, here's the point, if I can make it simple as we finish it up. Circumstance. Think of circumstances. Now, what is God's ultimate plan for you? He want to spend eternity with you and I. Please keep this in mind. Once you get to know God, how do I know that? God died for me that I might be set free, that I can spend eternity from him. Calvary affirmed my value. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. You see, when I'm talking about affirmation, 
when I used to look at men and women who got all the tattoos and the body piercing in strange places, just be careful. No, it's all right. I used to be just like what you said. It used to be disgusting to me. But once I understand those three needs, that we're looking for love, we're looking for significance, and we're looking for security. We're looking for who we are, our identity. Anybody understand what I'm saying? That the way we treat our bodies, what we put on our bodies, how we look, we want to be approved. Come on, talk to me. We want to be approved. That is what those needs drive us. And so, therefore, once I recognize that, I saw a soul who truly is crying out. Crying out silently. Silently crying out. See me. See me. Love me. Love me. That's how they cry out. But we as Christians don't understand this process. We see through our own dim human lens that soul there with disgust. Shake a hand. And I think, is that what Christ did to me? Shook his head when he saw me in this miry, sinful pit. He didn't shake his head. He stuck out his neck to rescue me. And when this come home to my heart, it's no longer self-focus. It's no longer about me. It's about what, as Enoch said in Hebrews 11.5, Enoch, he said, before he was translated, he had this testimony. He pleased God. My behavior, my interaction, my words, are they going to please God or not? I want you to take that to heart. You've got to be intentional. Before you speak, before you speak, think before you speak. Is it true? Is it honest? And what you're going to say is redemptive. You know what I mean by being redemptive? Is it going to rescue that soul from the hole that it's in? Anybody understand what I'm saying? Even though you got words that you want to put that person in place, then you don't need to put them in place because it's not your place. That soul was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. It says we need a constant sense of the ennobling power of pure thoughts. The only security for any soul is right thinking. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The power of self-restraint strengthens by exercise. That which at first seems difficult by constant repetition grows easy until right thoughts and actions become habitual. Therefore, when you begin to just share, rehearse those thoughts of God, it becomes part of your DNA. Just like the thoughts you had before you became converted. Sometimes you don't have to think about what you're going to say because it's in your DNA. Romans 7, 23. It said, Paul said, I said, another law. The law of sin in my members. That's in my DNA. So we're not fighting against flesh and blood. Supernatural power. You cannot overcome these negative thoughts in your own strength. Jesus said, you can't do nothing with me. you got to come to Christ. And I'm going to give you a closing statement. And you're going to have to cry out to the Lord. I had to do that. 38 years in the ministry. God didn't have my heart, and he still allowed this ministry to keep existing, but going in circles. Uh -huh. And when I came alive and recognized what God was telling me, I had to fall on my face and cry out with repentance and confession. And he still waited till he saw that his son was real. And I tell you, like now, I go to bed, 9 p.m., I'm not ruminating. I go to sleep. It's not fatigue sleep. It's restful sleep. When I'm facing my fellow workers and there's impasse, there's my wife and dad, there's, you know, you know, relationship, trying to deal with relationship, this and that, all kind of stuff. I remember when I first came from that experience, we had an uh, uh, administrative meeting, and the people going to look to you because you got influence. We came to an impasse. They said, they said Jackson, what are we going to do? Now, prior to my experience, I said, well, you know, Let's come up with a plan. Let's, let's come up with a plan. 
Those words have never come out of my mouth in late eight years. I said, God said, every problem is a call to pray. Amen. I said, what we're going to do is pray. In time past, prayer would have been the second thing. I said, now, let, let me, let's process and let's see what we can do. I don't do that no more. I don't have the answer. I got in trouble because I had the answers. You don't have answers to your family's problems. You don't have answers. If, if you keep consulting yourself to try to solve family problems, it's going to get worse. You've got to go to God. You've got to ask God, search this heart. See, is there anything wicked in me blocking you from working through me to reach my family? And you've got to let God bear in your life fruit that will give credence and support to your words because your words only can be backed by a life. That's reflected of the heart of God. Jesus taught what he lived. Hmm? Amen. I gave Amen. power to it. Yes. It goes on and says here, if we, will make, if, we, if we will, we may turn away from all that is cheap and inferior and rise to a higher standard. We may be respected by men and beloved by God. Is your life. Huh? As I mentioned, this is what Christ's method of healing that's how he healed, mental, physical, and spiritual, wholeness. We shared that Matthew 9, 1 through 8. Christian with anxious heart. We're almost finished. Christian with anxious heart. Listen, please. Many who profess to be Christ's followers have an anxious, troubled heart. Now, listen to the reason why. Troubled heart because they are afraid to trust themselves with God. What y'all think about that? I process. They, this is what it says now, they do not make a complete surrender to him for they shrink from the consequences that such a surrender may involve. We'll come back. I want you to tell me about this. Unless they do make this surrender, they cannot have peace. Mm. that's clear as day to me Amen. maybe not to you it was clear as day to me because I was not complete surrender to God that's why I didn't have no peace when I slept that's why I didn't have no peace when I was confronted with negative influence and God had to do something drastic to me he won't do it to you but because he, he knows he has a special plan for each one of us tailor made for you what he sent me through he's not going to send you through you know what I'm saying but he will send you through a process that's going to help you to really fall at his feet Amen. and cast your self-righteousness in the dust. Amen. He got to put it in the dust, folks. Right. Don't be afraid of it. Just say, Lord, give me grace. <laughs> Paul prayed three times for that thorn to be removed. Mm. He prayed three times. He had, that com he had that encounter on the road of Damascus. Three times. Blind in light. And though Paul, to me, outside of Christ, was a man that truly reflected Christ. And he wrote quite a bit of the New Testament. Would you say so? Amen. 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 With infirmities, especially his eyes. With infirmities. He prayed three times. Three times to God. God said, no. Paul, I'm not going to do that. Because my grace is sufficient. Amen. I'm not going to do that because it's a reminder of your dependence upon me. Amen. Did you get that? Paul said, when I'm weak, I'm strong. Amen. When he recognized that he was nothing, then God's power could be manifested. Amen. Therefore, why? Because we fear, we're afraid to make a complete surrender. For they shrink from cons the consequence that such a surrender may involve. If we may totally get God charge of our lives, what are the consequences? We might lose friends. We might lose jobs. You get what I'm saying? Those are consequences that we don't want to take place. Complete surrender. Unless we do that, we won't have peace. That should be a delete button on the control button. <laughs> we should raise the flag. <laughs> I surrender. Christ give us that invitation, Matthew 11, 28, 30. The servant of God tells us he regards us with pity, 
We'll find help in him. He will do great things for those who trust in him. Because we can do all things through Christ. Open the door to our hearts. Let him come on in and sup with us. What will you do to accommodate the king of glory? Can you offer him a place to dwell? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and with me. When he come into your life, he fights your battles. Amen. He fight your battles. Any closing comments or questions before we pray? Because God want to give us a new heart. He want to take away that stony heart and give us a heart of flesh, a new heart. Any questions, comments? Before we read this closing statement, you need to write this down. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. so where are you now then what you gonna do about that give him more time <laughs> as God leads care about him more. amen he amen pray about him. that's all right all right let's read this closing statement again I, and you need to really write this down put it in a book in your Bible that's come from Christ object lesson page 159 paragraph 3 so let's read it together what it says, let's read it. No outward observance can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. But no man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish this work. Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. Amen. That need to be indelibly imprinted in your mind, in your book, until it becomes your DNA. You and I cannot give our hearts to Christ. We must give him consent. Every morning, you got to make that commitment. Spend time on your knees. Spend time in the Word. Set a time. Let no one interfere with that sacred time. You don't have to spend hours, 30 minutes in the morning. I call you can have what you call 15, 10, 5. You can spend 10 minutes of reading, 10 minutes of study, 10 minutes even reflecting on what you read. But it's got to be systematic. And when I came out this situation, God gave me this devotional study to know God, to know God. I had to go back in my 30 years and go all over again to learn about God. And those interested in, uh, could you put, my, put this back up for me please? so I get this last that. If you're interested in that devotional study that I received that I've been using for the last seven years, become acquainted that has impacted my life, changed the trajectory of my life, my relationship, etc. Improve my biblical husbandry, biblical father. Once you get to know God, fall in love, it's going to change you. I guarantee. I just want to put a last slide up there with the address. Somebody want to email. What you do, you can... Uh, I tell you what, that's my office email. Take down my, take down my personal email if you're interested in to know God. It's a systematic study, devotional study. You can take that down. And my email address, my personal email, 
is T. Jackson, T. Jackson at meetministry.org. And that's the office. So just put T. Jackson at meetministry.org. It comes directly to me. You understand what I'm saying? And I'll be glad to send you the devotional study in those three needs, the love, significance. So you put email. I'd like to have the devotional study in the three God-given inner needs. If you don't have an email address, you can just write to me. That's the address. Any closing questions, comment? I, I pray. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hold on. Hold, hold on. Hold on. You mentioned the sacredness of the Bible. Yes. Um, that we don't treat it just any kind of way. Absolutely. All right. What about writings from Sister White or even the Sunday Law book? Well, I don't know uh, about the Sunday. They are of God. But no, I can tell you that I know the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Because that's not Sister White writing. That's God's word used by her. Now, there's other books by men who wrote, but the Bible and those writings of God, those are sacred. Mainly the Bible. This book here, the reason I say that, because I see books on the floor. But this here is the word of God. You've got to treat it that way. 